Hi, everybody. Well, uh, welcome to this event about the future of biohacking. Um, thank you for attending or later if you're doing that. Um, my name's Lexi. I'm a, I'm a transhumanist and an anarchist, and I've been involved in the grinder community for quite a long time. And the uh, what I'm doing here today is I'm going to be illustrating some of the developments that we've had that are hopefully going to make transhumanism and cybernetics more accessible and hopefully uh, it'll encourage more activity in the grinder community. Without further ado, I'll start talking about uh, the kinds of things that we've been doing. Uh, but first, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the grinder movement or the biohacker movement. It was inspired by Left Anonym, who gave a talk in late 2010. She uh, gave a talk about how, for example, if you take a magnet and you implant it into your finger, it gives you a sense of electroception. It gives you the ability to feel certain kinds of magnetic fields. And a lot of people saw that talk and some of the potential that left anonym uh, illustrated in that talk and a movement started forming. We started um, collaborating more. The biohack.me forum was founded in early 2011, uh, inspired by left anonym's talk. Um, so a whole bunch of us went at, onto this forum and we, started trying to collaborate on projects. Um, however, after about a year or so, it became apparent that we weren't actually getting anything done on that forum. So what we ended up doing, a few of us got together and we decided that if we formed ourselves into a kind of company structure, then we might get more done. And that was Grindhouse Wetwares. And we now have been around for about five years, give or take, and now we're actually making practical cybernetic implants. The only problem that we've encountered is that making implants turns out to be kind of difficult. Um, there are a number of problems in making implants. For one thing, in order to get anything non-trivial, you're gonna need a battery. Batteries are big and they're expensive. And the ones that are neither big nor expensive aren't gonna provide enough power to power an implant that does anything that you might want it to do. Of course, there's also the problem of charging the battery. The, uh, the solution that we've all seem to have converged on is called inductive charging. And what that essentially does is it allows you to make a little antenna on the implant, and then you can wirely tran wirelessly transmit power onto that implant. But inductive charging uh, creates its own problems. If you place the antenna incorrectly, it can damage components, for example. You, there needs to be bioproofing of the implant because putting metals into your body and allowing your body's natural enzymes to interact with those metals isn't actually a very good idea. You need to coat it in a substance like silicone or parolene in order to prevent your body from your body's natural enzymes from degrading the implant. And then of course uh, there's the problem of actually making these electronic circuits small enough to go into the body. Those of you who read some of the required reading saw Tim Cannon, my colleague's circadia implant, and like that thing was absolutely huge. It was the size of the, an iPhone. Although most of that was actually the battery, it wasn't the actual implant. But even still, it was big enough that we don't really want to repeat that experience. Um, so, a little bit more of the history of Grindhouse Wetware. As I just mentioned, the first implant we actually did was called Circadia. Circadia 
was an implant that was designed to wirelessly communicate with your smartphone over Bluetooth. And it would constantly record your temperature data and send that data to your phone. Now, as I just said, the problem is that this was a huge implant. Mo most of it consisted of the battery. Um, most of it, um, well, the other main problem was that we ended up having to abort the experiment because the battery stopped working. And even when the battery was working, it only provided about a day or so, 24, 24 hours maybe, of charge for the implant. So that was clearly not a practical implant. And it wasn't really meant to be. It was an experiment to prove that we could implant anything. Um, so after that, we started putting in the effort to actually making these into viable implants. And then we came up with the North Star. Um, the North Star is a different implant, which has LEDs that allow uh, that allow the implant to light up through your skin and it also uh, has the ability that you can tap it and it will light up so it's not constantly on. Now this particular implant didn't actually have a battery in it or it had a battery it didn't have charging and so you could only light it up so many times I think it was several thousand times um, before it would run out run out of battery power but this again was more meant to be a prototype than anything else but it turned out to be fairly popular because we actually got the body modification community they went up to us and asked for implants that would light up their tattoos for example so we listened to them and created them and we do that but now we've got something called the North Star 2.0. Now the North Star 2.0 is an implant that we're designing to be a better version of the regular North Star. This one actually has charging, it has LEDs like the last one, and it's also got an accelerometer on it. And what that accelerometer is going to do is allow it to track your hand movement. So for example, if you made a circle with your hand, the North Star 2.0 would be able to track that and you could set it so that for example if you make a certain gesture it will call you an Uber to go home. If you make another gesture it might activate a home automation system. Um, things like that where you can control things just with your hand movements. Um, one possibility I've seen is that you might be able to make a translator from sign language which would be interesting. But the fact that we have a North Star 2.0 that we think is a viable implant now isn't really the point. Now that we have North Star, as part of that process, we had to solve a lot of problems in making implants. What we now have is a chassis that we can put implants on in general, and it will hopefully work just as well as a regular North Star. Now, we haven't tested this version of North Star yet, so anything could go wrong at this point. But we do have a base that consists of an antenna for charging, a battery, microprocessors, and it all fits on something that's about the size, maybe even smaller than a quarter, a United States quarter. And we can use this for other implants. And what we intend to do is create something called a Grinduino. Now, some of you might have heard of the Arduino. For those of you who haven't, it's a platform that you can use in order to communicate with microcontrollers. Um, you can connect this thing to your computer using a USB connection and send C code onto it in order to program it. You can take electrical circuits and connect them to the pins on the microcontroller and have it the microcontroller do stuff with those circuits and the interesting thing about the arduino is that you don't actually have to be an embedded engineer you don't have to be an electrical engineer in order to be able to use this thing 
Uh, you can do it just by learning some basic electronics, um, learn how to use a breadboard, learn how to use jumper wires, learn how to program some really basic C code, and you can use this platform. And the result is that the maker movement really took off, and I believe to a large degree it was due to the Arduino platform. Um, because it's so accessible to hackers who aren't specialized in microcontrollers or electrical engineering, um, you really can do many things with this. For example, I've seen makers build their own 3D printers or CNC machines that go you know, for all the logic and all the programming that it needs. I've seen people make random things like sensors that are able to detect the humidity in uh, in your soil, for example, so you know when it needs to be irrigated. There are a ton of things that you can do with this platform. And the important thing is that if you have the idea, you can turn it into an actual device. Um, you don't have to have the specialized knowledge, as I said before. All you need to do is learn some basics and have an idea. And this is why the Arduino really activity among the maker movement. And what we want to do is do that for the grinder movement. Arduino for biohackers, which we call the Grinduino. The idea is that we want to abstract away the difficulties in making implants. We don't want you to have to worry about charging or the battery or bioproofing do since we already have this North Star implant um, that we are currently testing we can make it into a generalized platform so that once again you can turn your ideas for implants into um, so this is going to consist of two parts one thing that you could buy is simply an, a grinduino board that uses this North Star chassis. And you can simply solder your electronics onto it and do prototyping with it. The other thing that we want to be able to do is be able to submit your design to Grindhouse or maybe to a spin off. And what we will do is we will build your implant and we will bioproof it for you so you don't have to worry about bioproofing. Um, it's real, so it's really going to be a very interesting, uh, a very interesting service. We hope that if you have an idea for a cybernetic implant that you think would be awesome, we design, create your design, and you don't have to have specialized knowledge in order to do that. Submit the design to Grindhouse Wetware, and then you will have an actual implant. We, we think this will really unleash the creativity of the grinder movement. Now I'm going to switch gears a little bit. I've described that, the Grinduino platform, that onto uh, the second project, which is going to be called Imperius. Those of you who read about uh, Kevin Warwick's Project Cyborg, which was part of the part of the required reading or viewing for this. Um, in 2002, Kevin Warwick, who at the time was a professor of cybernetics at University of Reading, um, by the way, professor of cybernetics has got to be the coolest job title I've ever seen uh, anyone ever hold in the real world. Um, I've never heard of any position like that anywhere except at the University of Reading. But... Uh, in 2002, what Kevin Warwick did was he took a little microchip, which had 100 pins on it, and he implanted it into his nervous system. He implanted it uh, into his median nerves, which are right in your arm, and they essentially control your hand movements and are able to read sensory data from your hand. It's a little trunk of nerves there. Um, Utah array because it was made in Utah. And uh, each of these pins can be used as an electrode. 
also a means is that you can use these pins to measure voltages and you can also apply a voltage to the electrodes. And what that essentially means is that you can read the signals coming onto the nerves and you can also write signals. So it's a, it's a two-way transceiver. Um, it just is a little chip about by two millimeters, I think. Um, and it's got a whole bunch of need, little needles that are these electrodes that you into the nerve fiber. This new interface, what Kevin Warwick could do um, is do things like control robots just by opening and closing his hand. He could drive a wheelchair around and just with his hand movements, he could operate a home automation system. Um, he could also extend his senses. So, for example, what he could do, if because if you remember, he could also write signals into his nervous system. So he could take a sensor, like a sonar sensor, of distance, like a bat's echolocation, and you can pump the output into the nerves and be able to distance. And so what Warwick was able to do was he was able to sense with a blindfold on whether or not something was going towards him or away from him and get an approximate sense of how far things were if they were right in front of him. And of course, this isn't limited to sonar sensors. Um, you can do this with infrared senses, which um, is, is like a heat sensor. So everything in the world is emitting radiation that depends on how hot it is, what temperature it's at. And so and for objects that we actually encounter, so if you have a sensor that can sense infrared, that sensor will be able to actually detect how hot something is at a distance. That's how infrared thermometers work, for example. And so you could, if you were equipped with this new sense, you could go into a club and figure out who the hottest person in the room was. Um, Kevin Warwick could also do some other interesting experiments. He was able to hook up his own hand to a robot hand and be able to get the robot hand to mimic his own hand movements. And he could even do that in the ocean. So he was in New York and the hand was in Reading, England, and he could still, using the internet, get the hand to make his own hand. Um, so uh, you don't have to be in the same place as the things you're controlling. The most that he convinced his wife, Irena, to get electrodes pushed into her nerves as well, and what they were able to do was they were able to move their own hand and the other person could feel it in their own hand. So it, what we're essentially talking about here is the beginnings of almost. I think this has a huge amount of possibility. Um, and what I've just described is probably the tip of the iceberg, really. Um, the possibilities are almost limitless. What you essentially have is a connection between and computers. One set to transmit or receive signals to and from the implant, you could control or read data from um, with the implant. So uh, because of how cool this experiment was, uh, a little bit after I got involved in biohacking, I decided to figure out what it would actually take to replicate this as a biohacker. So I found the company that makes these Utah arrays. It's called BlackRock Microsystems. Um, and I asked them for quotes for some of the equipment that we would need for this. So the Utah array, 4,000 US dollars. So, you know, it's it's pretty expensive, but it's not necessarily completely out of the question. 
So that was back in 2012. So it's probably more expensive today. Problem is, I also asked them for a quote on a head stage on a head stage, which is something that you would mount onto onto the person, which would be able to send and receive signals directly from the implant. That was twelve thousand U.S. dollars, and that's not even counting all the other stuff that you would need, like an amplifier, a power supply for the amplifier, a data acquisition card. To stimulation, you need to have a specialized piece of hardware for that. And you can pretty easily see how this project is going to run up easily into the tens of thousands of US dollars. So this is definitely not something you're going to be able to do on a do-it-yourself scale. So that's why I came up with a project called Imperius after the unforgivable curse from and this is essentially an attempt to replicate Project Cyborg at a do-it-yourself hacker's grinder's level. It is that really the Utah array is the only part of the apparatus that I couldn't design and build myself. Cheapest part, as far as I could tell, um, at, at about 4000 US dollars. Um, but filters and amplifiers and data acquisition cards are all very standard circuit designs. Um, neurostimulation is a very rich topic. And interestingly enough, you can find a lot of neurostim circuits from reading people's PhD theses. Very interesting. Um, the only problem is that you have to miniaturize all of these in order to fit into an implant. And Especially since, if you remember, there were a were hundred pins on this chip, so that's a hundred different signals that you have to read or write, and so you have to make a hundred copies of all these circuits. So you can't miniaturize these using ordinary methods. What you're going to have to do, or what we're going to have to do, is make a custom ASIC, application-specific integrated circuit, and what it essentially is, it's a little microchip that is specialized to do a very specific task. In our case, we want it to be specialized for reading neural signals and, and creating neural signals. Um, unfortunately, ASICs turn out to be pretty expensive to make, but uh, we can get the price down to very manageable levels with group buys. So I can't promise anything, but. Uh, what we're intending to make this is we're going to make it cost a few thousand dollars rather than a few tent, um, which is that affordable? Well, it's at least a start. I mean, we just knocked off an order of magnitude to make one of these interfaces. Um, what you could do with this is you could, uh, this is in the realm where you could save money maybe to buy this thing. More likely, you might want to do group buys where a whole bunch of biohackers get together and make these things. So what we're planning to do is we're planning to make uh, an implant which consists of the Utah array, an ASIC that's specialized for processing and neurostimulation so, so that you can transmit those signals to a device that's outside of the body. and we. We actually embed all that into the back of the Utah array, um, which I, th I think is actually pretty cool because it means that you have uh, an entire implant that's going to go into your nervous system that's about the size of a head and it's on a U.S. So if you have a penny, um, this, the implant's going to be smaller than Abraham Lincoln's head. Um, so we're currently in the process of designing, the, uh, the, the actual circuits we're going to in the first step, which is going to be a micro microneurography, uh, is essentially, uh, reading and writing signals to and from the nervous system. But instead of using a Utah array, we're going to get needles 
basically designed to act as electrodes, and we're going to stick those needles into the arms, into the, and then we can clamp onto those needles and connect them to the prototype circuits that we're currently making. Why we want to do it because we want to make sure we make, and also uh, we want to do it before we actually implant anything because uh, putting implants into your nerves is both expensive and risky. Um, so this is going to be the first step, and we hope to uh, have this experiment done by either the end of the year or a couple months into 2018. Uh, so we're on a and I think we have a very good chance of making that actually happen. So um, what we're essentially doing to summarize all of that is we want to uh, lower the barrier to making implants because making implants is hard, making neural interfaces is even harder. Um, and the two projects that we have in the works are going to be the Grindwino which allows you to design implants and, uh, and have them made uh, sort of Arduino style. And then the second project is called Imperius, which is going to be a do-it-yourself neural machine interface or the cost of making these interfaces. And uh, I guess the thing that I want to ask before we get into the more uh, dialogue Q&A part is... Uh, is you know what, what would you do if you had the ability to make any implant you want and have it connect to your nervous system? Um, maybe if we unleash the creativity or grinder community, uh, maybe we could just enable transhumanism uh, just uh, just from that and make these cybernetic implants uh, make these cybernetic implants take off. Uh, in a way that is open source so that you control them and relatively low. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank, thank you. Um, was, uh, so I have three people in here. Do they, uh, I don't think Sanguine had audio, but, uh, do Evan or Rebecca have any questions or discussion points? Uh, we can maybe activate people's microphones and cameras. Um, uh, but real quick, could people put, go into their bandwidth up the top and maybe put it a couple notches lower because with everyone, oh, Chad is so much more comfortable speaking. Great. Um, then we will. We can just read out chats. I'm going to read out from the uh, Facebook or whatever. If if anyone, if anyone, yeah. so many. Um, but I was. Um, yeah, I know. I know that I covered a lot of ground there. So uh, uh -huh. definitely, definitely ask any questions you have. Uh, I was sort of like thinking about the, the bioproofing part as like, I got just nervous cause it's like, it seems risky and stuff because you know, if you're, if you're making sure that the enzymes aren't degrading the, the metals, like you're also making sure that like nothing's, you know, poison, like, and there's just, I mean, it's. I'm, I'm certainly very not knowledgeable, but even, I mean, even as far as I understand it, people who are very knowledgeable don't have a lot of questions about like the nervous system. Like there's a lot of like unknowns and it's like very chaotic and like, um, as, as, as far as I can understand it. So, so like, just like the, this, this mad scientist like reputation that, that it has to, you know, implant, to, to try and implant that like, might not work. <laughs> Um, like how, like what's it, I'm, I'm like super interested in what's it like talking about risks and like at, 
like at Grindhouse, like, and trying to like, um, I'm just imagining like everyone, you know, uh, hoping that they're right about something or, or hoping that they're not missing like a part of the equation that like some disastrous, you know, inner, like subtlety in the nervous system could be disastrous. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I actually had multiple implants uh, fail. So, um, like I said, the circadia, uh, the battery ended up failing about halfway through the experiment. We originally wanted to get it removed from Tim after six months, and we ended up having to do three months. And we found out that was because the uh, antenna was placed incorrectly so that it was actually heating up the battery. And then... Uh, the first version of North Star, we te we t implanted uh, some of them into a bunch of Grindhouse members, and we uh, and a whole bunch of them just started failing. And we're still not a hundred percent sure why. We we we're pretty sure that we have a good idea. And when we redesigned things, uh, the implants started working. Um, but uh, yeah, obviously there's a risk that some unknowns in the body are going to uh, are going to make it not work. Um, and kind of our attitude at Grindhouse is that uh, we test these things out so that you don't have to, because we're we're mostly willing to accept these risks that we're going to have to uh, cut these prototypes out and replace them with another one. Um, uh, and yeah, uh, uh, neural implants are definitely becoming something that's getting more and more studied. We're seeing more, uh, PhD theses or theses written about them. But yeah, there's definitely a lot of unknowns and we, our attitude at Grindhouse is that there's only one way to find out. The uh, submission process um, is something I was really, I was really glad to hear about, and it's like amazing. Um, that was just like amazing to hear about because, like, that's exactly, exactly, that is exactly the kind of vision that's sort of missing, where like um, the gap between experts and users, and like who can be an early adopter and stuff. Um, I'm really curious as to like the economics of even of even that proposal and, and just this organization and like where it um, I mean even just like even just like like funding if there's like stuff you're willing to disclose like because um, how can like it's good to like you know not not keep things exclusive to experts and like have ways for um, I just noticed there's a. I'll just I'll just finish up and then I'll get to Rebecca's question. Um, like ways to to make it more accessible than just for experts is like incredible. And then at the same time, it's like, like who's how are they getting paid? You know, like in this in that in that s scenario. Um, and that's just that's just another uh, kind of really interesting component. I'm I'm personally curious about. Yeah. Um, so as, uh, as far as our funding goes, um, we are trying to get funding and, uh, having mixed results about it. Um, but, uh, one of the reasons why we're able to, I guess, make these things, uh, more accessible is because it turns out that, uh, like a lot of things, if you buy things in bulk, then they become a lot less expensive. Um, it's just going to be that there's a high startup cost that you need to actually buy all of these things. And so what we're planning to do is we're planning to organize uh, group buys where they submit their designs or else uh, 
or else pre-order Grinduino boards or that sort of thing. And uh, and we think we can get the cost down to you know a few hundred dollars per implant rather than per implant. Yeah, but you can't say like get some VCs to uh, like it's it does it doesn't you know it you can't you can't sell it as like it's going to be profitable. So like give us millions of dollars up front because we're going to make it profitable in a few years or something because like you want to be open source and like, you know, like you can't use the VC system. It just sounds like, it just sounds like the VC system wouldn't work for like something that's, you know, rapidly open source. Have, uh, we are oh, we trying. Have, uh, we are and, trying. Um, an echo from echo here, from Mike. Um, but uh, we, we are trying to get VCs and we, we do have connections that are pretty enthusiastic about us, so we're, but we'll see how it actually goes. Awesome. So I'm going to read out Rebecca's. Lex, can you say something? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh no! I um I thought maybe your audio cut out because it it got a little choppy, but I think you're still here. So I was gonna read Lexi's, uh, no, not Lexi's, Rebecca's, uh, comment or question. Uh, Lexi, have you tried the North Star or any of the Grindhouse implants yourself? I'm just curious about your experience, uh, of what the implementation slash integration slash rejection process feels like. So um, I've ch I do have implants. I have a, I have a, an NFC RFID chip implanted on my hand here. I have a I have a finger in my. Um, I haven't tried any of the Grindhouse implants. Um, I was I was going to. A lot of problems have uh, have come up from the fact that I'm in a different area of the world world that everyone else in the organization so uh, it turned out to uh, to be pretty difficult to uh, actually get me a North Star and get someone to implant it but uh, so I was originally going to be part of that test but it, it didn't end up working out um, as far as what it's like to get implants um, uh, it's going to depend on the implant. Uh, so, for example, getting a finger magnet is a lot more painful because you're uh, implanting it into your fingertips. But um, NFC chips are a lot easier because they make these sterile PET injectors that you have. You can have the implant come in, and then you just inject it into your skin and. Um, yeah, it's uh, like there's a hump that you have to get over when you're when you're having something implanted. Uh, but once the scalpel or once the injector or once the whatever gets past the part of your skin that has all the nerves in it, it's pretty much uh, downhill from there. Easy sailing from there. Uh. uh. I have a question. Um, I came sort of late to the party, so I apologize if this is a stupid or annoying question, but like, because I missed the first, I'm not sure how much, but most of, of your, your talk, what kinds of things are these implants gonna be, like the, the implants that you've, you know, done stuff with at this point, what, what do they actually do? Hadia implant, which was our first implant, um, essentially could connect to your phone over Bluetooth and it could, uh, it took your temperature at regular intervals, um, and sent those up to your phone. These that you could, uh, program to make it look cool, but the temp was the main thing. And, uh, if we may, and when we make future versions of Circadia, we can 
extend that so that it doesn't just take your temperature, it also takes your heart rate, your, um, your blood oxygen levels, and we might even be able to do blood pressure. So sort of an integrated quantified self implant. North Star, uh, North Star also had LEDs in it. Um, version two of the North Star is going to have uh, built into it so that it can read how you're moving your hand. So if you move your hand in a circle like this, it will be able to detect that you just moved your and for example, you could set, set your phone up so that it will call you an Uber when you make that gesture, or if you make a different gesture, it can uh, communicate with a home automation system, or um, I think I also mentioned that uh, someone had the idea of creating like a sign language translator. So you say. I'm liking the Circadia one because my first thought is so even before you can do the other stuff, it could tell if you were, you could use it to track whether you were ovulating. So far from what they do. Yeah. I think I missed, I missed um, some of the last thing. Yeah, because uh, Rebecca just said it to it. The, the last thing you said, your audio kind of chopped up a little bit. There was a little lag. Oh, I was just saying that uh, that the North Star uh, has an accelerometer built into it so that uh, the idea is it can track your hand in the talk. So uh, you set, you move your hand one way and uh, and your phone I don't know, sends a, sends a message to your friends on Facebook, you move it another way, it calls you an Uber. I had like one more thought when you were just talking about the, uh, to Rebecca's question, and just about like how weird like the mind and the flesh like are together. Like I had this pretty gnarly cut, uh, slice once, and after it was stitched up, and for like a while, and even when I got the stitches removed, it's healing. I'm getting these visions of it like splitting open, and like I feel like it's still split open, and I, I you know, I, I'm imagining it, like there's this, it kind of like haunts you, you know, mm -hmm. um, like the like a cut or an injury can kind of haunt you in really weird, interesting ways like that. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of literature on like phantom limb kind of stuff. Um, but like, that's just, you know, that's one of the things that I feel like if, if I tried being an early adopter, I like just the psychological like pressure of like, you know, having, there's a psychological yeah, pressure. And, uh, right? I, and yeah, I appreciate and even to, my experience, that's all I'm saying. Yeah, and uh, interestingly enough, we haven't actually had problems like that with the North Star implants, but Tim, when he had the Circadia implanted, that giant iPhone-sized, he was actually getting panic at him, so... Um, his, uh, you his, you step back like with, half a sentence smaller implants. Because of, cause um, of audio, like half a sentence because of audio lag or something. Yeah, it, it's uh, uh, when Tim had the circadia implanted, the the giant implant, he was having panic attacks uh, every time, like his or something. You'd be like, "Holy crap, the battery's exploding or leaking, whatever." So, um, uh, from our experimentation, I think the lesson here is if you go with smaller implants your mental health will be relatively intact because we haven't had problems like that with the North Star. But it, uh, the psychological aspect is definitely something to be aware of. Yeah, Rebecca, somebody in the group, it may or may not have been you, was talking about like, like their, um, their like, I forget what it, 
about focusing on that as like a whole topic in itself. I think they said they were like massage, had a massage therapy background. Yeah, that was, that was you. Yeah. Cool. So I suppose if there's no disagreement, it looks like we have heard the questions that are to be heard. Um, that, and thanks again, uh, Lexi, for the, for taking the time to, to present to us. I'm really glad to hear from the front lines of the biohacking movement what's going on. Um, but yeah, let's for uh, having me on. That was really cool. It was really cool, and hopefully, there's a lot of discussion once people start watching the video over the next over the next week. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. All righty, so I will stop the broadcast. I will see you guys around, uh, you know, on Facebook chats and and such. See ya. See ya.